kind of an interesting idea. I don't know if you've heard of those mirrors that flip you back so that you're actually not seeing a mirror image of yourself, but your actual self. And uh, I don't know if they give you such revelation, but an interesting thought, isn't it? What if we had a mirror that when you looked into that mirror, you saw exactly what you were? I wonder what your reaction would be. Hmm. Maybe uh, for some of us, we look in and go, oh goodness, some things have got to change. For others, it might be affirming. Wow, there is some beauty in there. There's something within me that God's thought was so precious it was worth him dying for. Could be a lot of reactions we have if we looked into a mirror, wouldn't it? thing we're uh, going into here in this final thing is the call to remember. And I told you when we started this, there was one large objective. Some of you sitting in here maybe are off to a good start on things. But that's not really what it's all about, is it? It's how will you finish by t the time this whole life thing is done. How will you finish? I look around, some of us are younger folks in here, like myself. Some of us are a little older, and, and some of us have seen the wear of time. Just think of just this church alone, who is in here. We've had those, uh, Pam standing up, thank you for sharing, uh, losing people that's too young to lose. Others you're worried about in their sickness. Maybe you're worried about your own health. Maybe there's, uh, uh, you're a cancer survivor, somebody under the shadow of cancer. There's all kinds of things going on just in this congregation. Might call it, as the uh, term would go, the uh, dark night of the soul. Everybody goes through them, don't they? And the thing is with this dark night of the soul is as important as fellowship is, and, and we must have this, you can be suffering acutely in something and you can be alone even while you're sitting in here. You need something to hold on to. This is where your faith really comes to the test. As, as I shared, not to, not to dwell on that, but Pam, as you shared the same things that you and, and uh, Rich have gone through, uh, that might crush someone else's faith they would just come out all broken and bitter. There needs to be something we can hold on to, that our faith needs to hold on to, even beyond what we're doing right now. And I would propose to you what we grasp is not a tool like your hand, it's actually the tool of your memory. There are things that if you want to survive, you better not forget. And that moves us on to why we put in icons. We're just following something God's already done. He's used stones and mirrors and all kinds of things himself in order for us to say, oh, when I see that thing, I'll remember this profound principle. And that's kind of where we are with things is we look at this, is that we all go through things and we all need something that we're holding on to that we need to remember God has told us. One thing we put out there, and I say, as you come in here, there are all the things, as much as we try and do, as much as we uh, uh, try to live up to, the first thing isn't in the duties. The first thing isn't in how this building is holding up. The first thing isn't in the programs you're running. The first thing is in you is remember to drink. Some of you are out there thinking right now, yeah, when I think of my life, I'm ready to drink. Well, I don't mean that kind of drink. Uh, that kind of drink only numbs you. I'm talking about the kind of drink that uh, Jesus himself called living water. So we have a fountain out there, and the whole purpose of that is just to give some symbol that when you come in here, you realize the first reason to come into worship is to drink in the Spirit of God and all that implies itself. 
Then uh, Pastor Chris uh, brought up the tree of life for us, brought up a whole bunch of deeper truths in that. And the idea with the tree of life, if we s distill it down a little bit, is in the roots and in the branches and in the fruit it bears, it's living relationship. I guarantee everyone in here too can do this. That if you went, when you go home from now, if you look, you can go live tree, dead tree, live tree. You know what a dead tree looks like. Not all trees are alive. The principles that allow us to stay alive. Well, what's the number one? You're not in here because of your faith, per se. This, that's not in itself going to do a lot. You're not here so much for your profession. If we need something to hold on to, what we hold on to is a person. And uh, yeah, I know you may be here with your spouse, but that's not the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about God shows himself to us as a person. Until we're to the point we're holding on to the person of Christ, I guarantee you the rest of it's just kind of a soft, squishy thing. The only thing that makes a difference is holding on to the person of Christ. Kind of works like this, is the nature of our lives and that nature is what we see in the mirror. It's no wonder that we use this mirror as an icon. Transformation comes from the living water. The living water leads to a, a living relationship. And it all starts from the heart. It all springs from there. You drink it in, you transform, you grow. You drink it in, you transform, you grow. It's a cycle that goes on. And so it all comes back to us and what we are. Hence, we have that third icon sitting out there. We have, now if you came in, if you have those acute, razor-sharp uh, uh, ability of observation, you probably saw coming in this door, there is a mirror. And it is my hope that mirror, that mirror is one of the first things you see coming in. Actually, I would hope the first thing you see coming in is the fountain. And the last thing you see going out is the mirror. And that mirror isn't something I came up with. It is something that is used in Scripture. And James really uh, uses that to drive home a mental picture that if we understand the passage, we start understanding the secret that we better not forget. Now I'm going to read it in full. James 1, 21 through 27 Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. And he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word. This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but de deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. This passage in this whole book has been the cause of a whole lot of debate. Because is it this or is it that, as people look into it? And so we're going to take the words apart and see what's really going on in this passage. It almost reads like three uh, random uh, paragraphs. And then as we go on, uh, uh, it seems like uh, maybe we even see that what he's trying to say is in co conflict with itself. But we know scripture doesn't work that way. So what is being said in here? Well, let's start with the, the, uh, the seeming conflict for many people is the your Christ walk is what you are versus your Christ walk is what you do. So what is it? What you are or what you do? Wow, there's been all kinds of 
scholars fight over that one and debate that one. Is it what you are or what you do? Does James know? Is he just in conflict with himself trying to figure it out? What's going on? Well, let's consider some of the operative words that are used there. Let's uh, throw out a fancy word, say hermeneutics. Wow, okay. Do you use that? The next Bible study you're in, just throw that word out there. Well, I was looking into the hermeneutics of this, and then all of a sudden you are now the star of the Bible study. Inside tips from a bad pastor. I, I'm going to write a book. But anyway, let's try and be good in, in what we're doing here with the, past, with the uh, passage. And the operative words are, are interesting. He actually starts out with the nature of the person, of what you are. The first paragraph is starting to lean in that direction. He talks about filthiness. Well, you know what? That's what you are. You are either dirty or you are clean. And he talks about being implanted in the word, which... In effect, I love this, he's actually borrowing from Paul. A lot of people like uh, scholars say, well, James was actually uh, somewhat in odds with Paul. He's actually borrowing from Paul's own uh, analogies. And the word implanted with the, the uh, word actually means grafted in. Maybe some of you remember Paul using that. He says we, the uh, Gentile church, were grafted in to the olive tree, into the natural tree. And that's the uh, mental picture he's given. But you know what? You're grafted in or you're not. You are in the tree or you're not in the tree. It's something you are. It's part of your nature. He talks about being saved. Being saved is what you are. You are uh, in the status as a person in whatever, if we got into a large definition of what being saved means, but it is part of your nature. You are or you are not. The soul, tsuka, uh, the life, the mind, the heart. And, uh, and the word of course, I threw out, of course, is in the original Greek is what I, why I'm using that word because we want to know what the original guy said. And when he said it, these were the things he had in mind when he used the word. He was talking about the person's life, the person's mind, the person's heart, the person's seat of feelings, the person's desires, their affections, the essence that differs from the physical body, the ultimate of what you are. He's talking entirely here about what you are. And then there's this shift. It goes from what you are to doers, from being to doing. Doers of the word. Raises a question, what exactly is a doer of the word? Is it when you're doing stuff? As long as it's something you can find in the Bible, you're a doer of the word. Could say, it seems it might fit, as a church, that as long as we're busy here and we're doing stuff and it relates to God, are we doers of the word? Is that what he's talking about? Hmm. Or is doer start with something doesn't quite fit in with the way we started the passage? Because the passage didn't start out with what you were doing at all. It started out with what you are. So somehow doing ties into what you are. Well, maybe the first thing we're called to do then is obedience. Is doing the very thing that God is telling us to do at the time. You know, obedience may seem like, well, yeah, okay, there's a no-brainer for you. But we live in the what would Jesus do generation. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe you got the bracelet. Maybe you got the t-shirt. I don't know. But what, you, what would Jesus do has a, a, an implication. I don't think that was intended. And the implication is this, is that you're, you're out there in the world. You think about how Jesus might have done something. And so you imitate what Jesus would have done. Does God call us to that? Does he call us to imitate Jesus? Or does he call us to join Jesus? Does he tell us to be productive in anything that seems like something Jesus would do? Or does he call us to join him where he is? Jesus would say, if you get too big in the imitation game, I'm afraid you're in for a fatal mistake. Jesus himself said this of himself, John 5, 19. Very truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing by himself. Jesus never Try to imitate 
the Father or just do what he did. He says he can do only what he sees his Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Why does the Son do what the Father does? Because they're cut from the same cloth. Just like your dad. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Cut from the same fabric. That's what it's getting at. Doing God's stuff is not the first goal. Doing God's stuff is not the goal of the church. Doing God's stuff is not the goal of you as a Christ follower. The first objective is godly obedience. And then we go from there. And if that's the first order, then let's ask yourself, if you can't get away from that, is that, if that question always has to be answered in the affirmative, if you want to be on the rails, what does it look like to be in godly obedience? Philippians 2, 12, 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Isn't that an interesting line? We talk about only Jesus saves, and yet we're here, work out your own salvation. Does that mean you work for your salvation? Of course not. It means that the first order of business is working on who you are. For if God, it is God who what works not around you, not for you, not above you, not below you, works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Hebrews 13.21, echoing the same um, sentiment, same principle, making you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. First order of business, obedience, and obedience is what you are. And as your obedience, it works in you and it transforms what you are. What you are is the first order of business. What you're becoming starts with what God is in you. So not surprising, here we are. We're with this idea of a mirror because what is more of a symbol of what you are than a mirror? Some of you probably got up this morning. If you were like me and you looked in the mirror and you scared yourself for the first few minutes and then started fixing yourself up because you looked at your hair and said, that messed up head is what I am. And I need to change that. Maybe you were up late uh, for uh, working hard and you looked in the mirror and you see rings under your eyes and you go, I am exhausted. Exhausted is what you are. Maybe you had a good night's sleep. Good for you. And you looked all glowy in the mirror and you went, that, well, that's what I am. I'm, I'm, I'm energetic this morning. But the mirror tells you what you are. Even if we think of the mirror in forms of... Um, uh, what it does when we're in motion, like because you have mirrors in gyms and mirrors in dance halls and mirrors in uh, 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 play with, where people are working out or doing martial arts, all kinds of things. Like there's, um, oh, I'm going to pick on you, Greg, because you're my gym man. There's Greg doing his curls in the gym and he's maybe looking in the mirror. Greg's not, not a conceited guy, so he's not, you know, showing off with his biceps, but what he would be doing, or in theory doing with the mirror, am I making this move correctly? Am I a master of this move? Am I mastering this move? So he's looking, even as he's in motion, at what he is. The dancer, am I a master of these moves? What am I? And they look in the mirror. What you are starts with the mirror, first order of business, what's going on in you. But a mirror is totally useless without a certain little human feature. It does you absolutely no good, no matter how good the mirror, how intently you looked at it, if the next thing is missing. And that's your memory. We read in the verse, immediately forgets what kind of man he was. He looks in the mirror and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. And that word in the Greek is the same as it is in the English. It's saying the same thing. What sort of person he is. What manner of person he is. What quality of person he is. What he is. 
And it's guaranteed, I guarantee you by the word of God and the principles of even what we're looking at here, is that it doesn't matter how noble your visible work is if you haven't gone through the invisible work done inside. It doesn't matter how noble your visible work is, the work outside you, if you haven't gone through the invisible work inside. You may do more damage than you do good. I'm not going to mention anyone. Use your own inventory. Think of, think of somewhere, some church, some group of people with the best intentions put out a message that they shouldn't be putting out and end up doing more damage than they do good. Happens all the time, and it can come around this very thing of what you are inside ultimately comes outside. What you are inside ultimately comes outside. And if we understand what happens inside is what is flowing outside, if we get that down, everything else in the passage starts to fall into place. Because here we are, first we started, we talked about who you are, what you are, and, and then we move from the inside to the outside, and, and that the, but it starts with the inside first, and you're moving to the outside, and then all of a sudden we're talking about the tongue. Well, not a bad illustration, but why all of a sudden we've gone from mirrors to the tongue? What's, what's going on in, uh, in this case? Well, James 3, 10 and 12 is... Uh, same book, same thought, same message, just a, a, another angle of it later on says this, Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, uh, my brethren, bear olives or grapes, uh, grapevine bear figs, thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh water. I was very grateful Pastor Chris told us last week was we explain the fountain, but don't drink out of the fountain. <laughs> but hypothetically, let's say we, we were to do that. If you went out to that fountain and you, you grabbed a, a cup full of that and drank it and it just tastes like straight vinegar, what would you assume? Oh, somebody filled the reservoir with bitter vinegar. Or if you went out there and you took a cup and it was all salty, what would you naturally assume? Oh, somebody must have put seawater or something of the sort in the reservoir for the, for the fountain because the fountain is simply relying on the reservoir, the spring, which springs from it and from the overflow, that's what it gives. You don't get fresh water from vinegar and you don't get vinegar from fresh water. It doesn't work that way. We all know it. Do we think people are any different? Do we think people are any different? Well, James had his idea. Does Jesus back that up? Well, let's look in Matthew 15. Start there. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from where? The heart. And they, that is what defiles a man, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, and he goes on to explain that. In Matthew 7, 18, he falls back to the same idea. A good tree cannot bear a bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Now as we go on, I, I know that he talks about bridling your tongue. That's part of it. You don't want to say everything you're thinking. Sometimes it's just out of someone's feelings. You know, it's like, well, they're so happy about this thing, but I, bet I, uh, I think I'll let them discover for themselves. I don't want to burst their bubble. And so you're kind of kind in the truth. But in this bridling of the tongue, what if it seems you have to watch your tongue on everything you're saying? Well, if I said what I was really thinking right now, or, and then in an hour, boy, if I said what I was thinking right now, Maybe the problem isn't with your mouth, it's with your heart. We can't distinguish the two or separate the two. What comes out of your mouth is coming from somewhere. Even as we bridle it, even as we filter, even as we're discreet, we better take a good look in the mirror and see what's in the reservoir, where that is coming from. A Christian is constantly called to stop and take a look 
at what's going on inside. The inner work flows outward, just like the fountain does out there. What's inside is what comes outside. It needs to come outside. If we had a fountain out there that did not spring water, we'd say it was broken. It's filled with water, wonderful. Great water, but none of it's flowing out. Well, we know we have a problem, but the reservoir has to be right first. John 7, 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. If you are in the right spring, you are not just drinking from the spring of God, you have become a fountain of God. If you go out there and you look in this mirror and get yourself angled just right, you know what you see looking back from the mirror? It's the fountain that'll be over your shoulder. A fountain is what we are called to be, and we will be if we're with the right spring. So the whole idea, what's happening inside is coming outside, and what's outside becomes very evident, and the tongue, we use our tongue more than anything. If we have a spring in this human body, it's the tongue, it's constantly flowing words out for good or bad, but it's constantly flowing words out, so we have this talk of the tongue, fits in. And then we do this shift. Now, we're not talking about the mirror. We're not talking about the tongue. Now we move on to the concept of religion itself. What is religion? What is religion? Just religion. Now, here's the interesting thing, if I fall back on the linguistics, we said in the original, the word that James uses here he is not Christian religion. He's not referring to that. He deliberately uses a word that just means religion in general. What's religion? Well, you know what religion really is? Religion is something that uh, you believe so much that you go out and do it. Not everybody who sits in a church even is a Christian in their religion because when they leave this place, they go out and do other things. No, religion is that thing you believe so much inside, you externalize it outside. Brings us back to kind of what's going on inside. So when you're in not just religion, but Christ religion, and it's pure and it's undefiled, then what does it look like? Man, I want to know. If this is flowing right, what's that water taste like? What does this life look like? And then uh, James is very practical. He simply goes on and says this, pure and undefiled religion before God. And that word before is a clue. Because before isn't even the best translation of the word. The translation in the original would be the word para. Now, even before we talk Greek, think in English, when we have the word para, what does it usually go along with? I liked it. Debbie, was it you this morning? I said parachute. Somebody said... I said Okay, yeah. Well, no, no showing off. No showing off. No. It's okay. It wasn't you. Okay. Well, we liked parachute, didn't we, Deb, in the first, because uh, it was beside or with you. And you know what? If you're jumping out of a plane at 10,000 feet, you want your parachute. You want that chute with you. That's an important thing. Beside is a word that means, but it means some other things. So if you use the word para along with God, it means the things that you do, as David said, beside God, it is the things you do parallel with God. It is the things you do from God. It is the things you do near God. It is the things you do of God and the things you do with God. Kind of a loaded word. Pure religion is when before God is all of those things. From, with, of, parallel to, same nature, same direction. All of this is going on. In other words, you're not so much imitating God as you are joining him where he is working. It's not a case of simply doing something for God. It's doing it in God. You are joining God where he is working. 
How can you join God where he is working? Well, because if we go back to the fact of who you are, if you happen to be cut now from the same cloth as God himself, then you will naturally join God where he is because you are the same thing. Para. Paraphrasing Pastor Chris's uh, uh, deeper truths. Uh, if I could play with your words a bit, Chris, I guess uh, as I listen, come down to this. As we talked about that living tree, we said we do God's nature, we do it in God's season, and we do it driven by the hope of being with God, in God. We do by God's nature, we do it in God's time, and we do it in the hope of God himself. John 5.19 says, The Father loves the Son and shows him all things, and he himself does it. So even who you are plays into pure religion. Who are you? And then you're doing what you naturally do. And then James, uh, he continues on with this. So what does it look like? Well, it looks like this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Well, is that literal or is that something else? Well, the answer is yes. It's both, actually, because when we look at it, the phrase, remember when he said this, he wasn't writing in uh, America in 2020 with our system of life. He was writing in the time of ancient Israel. And in the time of ancient Israel, nobody was more powerless, nobody was more poor, nobody was more thrown aside by society than orphans and widows. You were basically faceless if you were in those positions. So what he's saying is to take care of, to look out for the welfare of, which by the way is the meaning of love according to God. It's not the warm and fuzzies. Love is, despite whatever, I will look out for your welfare. I will never hurt you. I will always hope for the best. Uh, uh, if we read Corinthians 13, we find that out. But to look after the orphans and widows, in short as this, is that we give our most to the people who can pay us back the least. Isn't that crazy? Why would anyone do that? Why would you give to people who have no hope of paying you back? I mean, what's in it for you? Well... The thing that really drives us, and I, I, I come back to, Pastor Chris brought another great thing up. He talked about a distinctive that changes Christianity from everything, and it came down to motive. Well, what sets motive? The nature of who you are. The nature of who you are sets the whole thing up. So to take care of widows and orphans is for us to go out and take care, especially those who are the least able to do it themselves. And we don't do it in order to look good. And we don't do it to feel good. We do it because it is the nature of what we are inside, which is like our Father who is in heaven. That's the whole idea. And this is where James does this beautiful thing. I said we looked at three paragraphs, and we started out with who you are, moved in from who you are to the things you do, and then we looked at specifically the things you do because uh, of who you are, and we come all the way back to who you are. Because in pure religion, it ends with this thought, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. In other words, who you are. All set up on what you are inside. What work has been done in there? Who are you? Who are you? What you are is what will set up your destiny. What you are sets up the beginning of the, the whole picture. And since we end with the same thought, do you catch this? He starts with the thought of who you are and ends with the thought of who you are. Who you are is the beginning and the end of your walk. Who you are is a priority. Everything else is a journey in the middle. So here we have the Bible, this perfect context to the mirror, using this as, a, as an idea. And out there, underneath it, you probably notice there's the Bible verse from James. But beside it is the whole thing distilled down. And here's where, if you're talking about strategy, where I was coming from is this. 
<coughs> the mirror is there as we go out. And if nothing else, when you go by, the last thing you see before you hit the door is three questions. Right there beside the mirror. Who am I? Or what am I? Then, what am I doing? And then thirdly, what am I becoming? All three of those questions are something we better never put aside or forget.